Hello and welcome to the Martha Elizabeth Ray Chocolate and Pastry Lab here at the Advanced Technology Center at Gulf Coast State College in Panama City, Florida. My name is Chef Paul Ashman. I'm a certified executive pastry chef and an associate professor here at the college. Today we're going to be talking about, well, chocolate. And we're going to talk about what you can do with chocolate, how you can make your life easier by working with chocolate, and even some of the great new technologies that we're using to work with chocolate, such as everything from a tempering machines to all the way up to our 3D printer that I'm going to introduce you to later. But what we're going to start with today is, well, what exactly is chocolate? How do I work with it? And how can I do stuff with chocolate and make it look like a professional? So if you're ready, let's get started. Welcome back to the bakery. You know, every piece of chocolate that you've ever eaten in your entire life, Every piece that you're ever going to eat in your entire life started out probably in a subtropical forest somewhere, typically within about 20 degrees of the equator, in a funky alien-shaped pod that grew off of a tree. And the really amazing thing is that somebody reached up by hand with a hooked knife and cut that pod off the tree. Every piece of chocolate has been cut off by hand. That's a pretty amazing thing. There's no way to mechanically harvest chocolate. And then these people, typically women and children, sat down on the forest floor with a machete or a stick, hacked at this pod, opened it up, and pulled out 20 to 30 really yucky looking white giant kidney bean shaped, well, beans. They stacked them up, typically on banana leaves, covered them with banana leaves and let them sit and ferment in the forest or in the jungle for a couple of days. Over the process of the next couple of days, fermentation changed those beans. They went from white to a dark reddish brown. Some of the moisture was driven out, but more importantly, fermentation took place. And that actually changed the chemical composition of those beans and started to bring out some chocolate flavor but they weren't done yet. Typically, all those beans would be collected and then laid out either on dirt or a concrete slab to dry. The moisture has to be driven out of those beans. Then, when the moisture is down very low, under 5%, the beans are bagged up, typically 50 kilo bags, and then shipped to chocolate makers. So, now you've got the beans that have been cut by hand, processed by hand, in giant bags, typically on a ship or a truck, heading to a chocolate maker. Now, chocolate comes from all around the world. So chocolatiers will take these beans and actually mix and combine beans to come up with the types and the flavors that they want. So the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to take these raw cocoa beans and they're going to be crushed or winnowed so that the nib, which is actually the pure chocolate part, is separated from the bean or the agricultural, kind of like shelling a pecan. The inside is what you want. Once the nibs are separated, the nib is pure chocolate. It's 100% cocoa. So if you go and buy a, a bag or a box of chocolate that says 100% cocoa, that's a pure chocolate nib, or the terminology is actually chocolate liqueur. Now we get chocolate liqueur by taking those nibs and crushing them and processing them into a liquid. That liquid is called chocolate liqueur. Not an alcoholic beverage, it's just what it's called. So pure chocolate liqueur is 100% chocolate. Now, in the mid-1800s, a uh, Northern European, a man from, well, a Dutch man actually, learned how to process this a little bit differently. He put this pure chocolate liqueur, or chocolate liquor, into a hydraulic press, pressed it, and pressed all the fat out. And of course, the fat is cocoa butter, all right? Once that was all pressed out, he ended up with these large cylindrical pucks of pure chocolate that had no fat in it. Once it was crushed up, it became cocoa powder. And because he was Dutch, it's called Dutch process cocoa powder. Now. After that is all done, these materials will be recombined 
with varying amounts of sugar, milk, and other ingredients to create the types of chocolate that we like. Today in front of me, I've got some Belgian 52% dark chocolate. Now what that means is that 52% pure chocolate liqueur, and then the other 48 or so percent is made up of sugars, milks, things like that. Now, typically the darker the chocolate, people will um, associate that with a more bitter flavor. I think once you grow a little older, you become more attuned to the dark chocolate. And actually, the neat thing is that the dark chocolate releases really great endorphins in your brain and actually makes you feel happy, which is why, well, chocolate makes me happy. I don't know about y'all, but chocolate makes me very happy. I'm trying really hard, but it, it's kind of hard to stay away from sometimes. So what we're going to do now is we're going to learn how to get this chocolate into a workable state, and that's called tempering. So if any of you like chocolate as much as I do, you might have heard of the term tempering. Well, the term is really kind of going out of vogue. What I want you to think about instead of tempering is I want you to think about something, a term called pre-crystallization. And the reason we use this is that within this chocolate, there are six different fat crystals. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a certain number of those fat crystals to be solid at room temperature and a certain number of those crystals to remain liquid. And if we can do that just right, then we get the chocolate into a very workable state where it will become stable, dry, and it'll have a shine and more importantly, a snap. And those things are really the hallmarks of a truly workable chocolate. Now, there are all kinds of ways to do tempering, and I'm gonna use those terms interchangeably. The classic way, when I was a uh, young pastry chef working years ago, I would watch chefs do what's called the tabling method. And the tabling method is quite impressive. Basically, a large marble slab and chocolate will be melted and poured out onto the marble slab, and then it'll be wiped back and forth as the marble removes some heat from the chocolate to a certain temperature and then more chocolate to be added to it and to get the chocolate into a real workable state. Um, not that many people use the tabling method anymore. The next method we can use is, well, we can use a machine to do it. And I've got a couple of them here and I'll show you them a little later. We've got automatic tempering machines computerized that you just pour the chocolate into, set a few buttons, and boop, hit start, and walk, and come back later, and you've got fully tempered chocolate. Many chocolatiers use tempering machines because they keep the chocolate very stable and at the proper temperature for long periods of time and in great quantities so that they can use them for their production measures. Now, the one that I'm gonna teach you this morning is really the most easy to understand method and we call it the seeding method. And the seeding method is quite simple. We're gonna take a quantity of chocolate, and today I'm gonna to be using this, again, this Belgian 52%, but in this bag, it's in a bag form. This is 22 pounds of Belgian dark chocolate. And um, I'm gonna take this chocolate, and I'm gonna put it in the microwave. Yes, I said the microwave. Um, I know you'll see people using double boilers, and I want to caution you about using a double boiler to melt chocolate. Chocolate has one enemy, and that enemy is water. Melting this much chocolate, even a drop of water or two in this chocolate could cause it to seize. So I want to do whatever I can to mitigate the chances of water interfering with my chocolate. There's some other things you need to think about. If you use a microwave, well, I can't quite describe the smell of burnt chocolate in a microwave. If you can think of burnt popcorn times five, it's pretty bad. And what you wanna be careful is that chocolate, especially once it gets lower in the percentage, meaning it has a higher milk content, it will burn rather easily. So I want you to use a, some kind of a uh, bowl. Glass is great, ceramic's good also, because it'll retain some heat better than plastic. And try not to melt the chocolate for more than 20 or 30 seconds at a time. 
You're going to put it in the microwave, melt it for 20 or 30 seconds, pull it out, stir it. And keep doing that until there are no pieces of chocolate left. And of course, before you get it burnt, you want this fully liquid and it'll be warm to the touch. For this chocolate, that temperature is between 118 and 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Please don't take chocolate over about 125 degrees. More than likely, you're going to burn it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this, once it's fully melted, then I'm gonna seed it. Now, what that basically means is that this chocolate comes from the factory already tempered, all right? So that means that it contains within it proper fat crystals. Now, once this is all melted, I'll start to add these back into the chocolate. Little by little, stirring as I go, agitating the chocolate. What's gonna happen is these good seeds of crystallized, properly crystallized chocolate will begin to mix in with the melted chocolate cooling it down, and then seeding it with the proper crystals. I'll keep doing that until the chocolate stops melting. When the chocolate stops melting, I've achieved a perfect temper. It's as easy as that. That's all you have to do. So if you're ready, let's get started. Welcome back. Let's get started tempering our chocolate. Now what I have in front of me here is called my mise en place. That really should have been the first thing I explained to you when we started these videos. Mise en place is a French term. It means everything in its place. And it's a critical term that I teach my students on their first day of culinary school. Mise en place means having what you need for the job at hand ready so you don't have to run off and do something else. So my mise en place here today is, well, I've got my chocolate in a microwave safe bowl. I've got some extra chocolate that remember we're going to seed into this chocolate. A couple of spatulas, offset spatulas that I'm going to use to test the chocolate. A rubber spatula, a high temp rubber spatula that I'll use to stir the chocolate. And some parchment paper triangles that I'm going to use to pipe the chocolate with. So if you're ready, Get your microwaves ready. We're gonna start this 20 to 30 seconds on high at a time, stirring in between until the chocolate is fully melted. And then we're gonna come back and begin the seeding process. So if you're ready, let's get started. Welcome back. So this took about two and a half minutes in the microwave for this small amount of chocolate. And as you can see, it's fully liquid. Looks great, doesn't it? The problem is, is if I wanted to do something with this chocolate right now, say I wanted to pipe it out or roll a truffle or something in it, this chocolate probably would never set up because all the fat crystals are melted in it. And you may have had something like this happen. You, maybe you melted some chocolate in the microwave and tried to do something with it and it just never would harden up. And that's because all the different size fat molecules, well, they set at a different rate. And if they all set at a different rate, what you end up with is if you can imagine a bowl filled with all different size rocks, all the rocks are fitting in not in a very good way, maybe. And as they come together, they don't form any kind of a, a good structure. What we're trying to create with this is a crystalline structure that forms long chains and actually contracts a little bit when it fully hardens. It's one of the other hallmarks of a good tempered chocolate. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take some of my tempered chocolate and add in and begin to stir. What this is doing, this agitation is, yes, it's melting these pieces of chocolate, but what it's also doing is it's adding stable fat crystals to my chocolate. Now, if you'll notice, and you might be able to see in the overhead, that chocolate's already melting, okay? We're gonna keep doing this, adding a little bit at a time until it's completely melted. And once that is done and the chocolate no longer melts, we've got tempered chocolate. Now, the tempered chocolate for this 52% Belgian 
should be at about 91 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if you think about it, how could you test that without a thermometer? Well, right here on your bottom lip, you'll see chocolatiers a lot of time with a piece of chocolate stuck to their bottom lip because it's very sensitive. And a good way to test the chocolate and see if it's at a close to proper temperature, take a tiny dab and touch it right there. It's a very sensitive part of your body and your body temperature is gonna be somewhere in that 94 to 98 degree range. So it feels slightly cool to the touch right there. You know that you're in, at least in the ballpark. And that's what we're looking for. Now, there are good ways to test the chocolate. And if you can see, those chocolate chips have already all melted. So we know that we're still too warm and we don't have all the stable crystals. So you know what? We just keep adding. And we add and add and add until all that chocolate has become fully seeded with the proper fat crystals, okay? And I can look at this, and if you can look in the overhead, you'll see it. Those chocolate chips are melting, still melting pretty quickly. That tells me that this chocolate is warm. And also, I can feel this glass bowl. The glass bowl is going to retain much more heat than a plastic bowl will. That'll help keep your chocolate workable for a longer period of time. So you just want to keep stirring, and the stirring is really important. That agitation is what helps move those stable crystals around. And if you look and see in here, guess what? All those chips have just about melted again, but I can feel it starting to just slightly cool off. So I'm gonna add a few more chips. Now you don't wanna add a giant number of chips at any one time. Many chocolatiers will take and put a block of chocolate in. And once that chocolate reaches the right temperature, they can just take the block of chocolate out. And that is also, you know, one of the hallmarks of the seeding method. But here I can see this chocolate is slowing down as far as it's melting. And I'm gonna keep stirring. It's flowing nicely, all right? Taking all I can do just not to lick this. But I won't, at least not on camera. Stir, 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 and I'm getting close. I can feel it getting close. I can feel the consistency of the chocolate changing just a little bit. And as I mash it against the bottom, I can see that there are still some little bits of chips remaining. So I'm only gonna put a few in this time because I'm pretty close. Now, as you're picking out chocolate to temper, I want you to try to steer towards, well, I hate to say brand names, but steer towards better, maybe even a little bit darker chocolates. It's gonna be a little easier to work with. A lot of times the chocolate chips that you buy in the grocery store will have some sort of a wax coating um, and uh, they're not as easy to get really tempered and because of the high milk and high sugar quantities in them they just don't temper quite as well. Darker chocolate will temper better. I'm pretty close. Now what are some other ways to test this? Now yes I could take my pinky and I did wash my hands and dab it on my lip and it's pretty close. What's another way to do it? Well, what I'm looking for is this chocolate to fully set up at room temperature. So I'm gonna take an offset spatula, dip it in the chocolate, and turn it over. What's gonna happen, hopefully, if I've achieved a proper temper or a proper pre-crystallization is, within three to five minutes, this chocolate will fully set up at room temperature. That's what I'm gonna look for. And I'm actually gonna look at the edge of this chocolate and see if it begins to contract. Those kinds of visual cues are what's gonna help you become a better chocolatier because you're not gonna need a lot of the fancy tools, whether it be um, thermometers and, or even chocolate tempering machines. If you learn how to do the process by hand, then you'll be able to do it a whole lot easier and in smaller quantities. Say you just need a little bit of chocolate. So I'm gonna keep Working this, I'm gonna let this sit for a minute, and I'm gonna add just a couple more chips in, a little bit of insurance, um, and try not to get dirty doing this. It's, it's sometimes it's unavoidable, but as we work with the chocolate, one of the things, um, and some of the chocolatiers that I've worked with in the past uh, are some of the cleanest chefs I've ever worked with, mainly because they really we're able to understand the chocolate, know how to work with it without slinging it all over the place. Um, as a student, 
we would have chocolate everywhere. And my students, when we're in chocolate training as part of our pastry class here, oh gracious, the bakery is just a, a wash in chocolate. But um, it typically is always a, a good time here when we get to work with chocolate. So I'm stirring. I think I'm pretty much there. We're going to take another look at our chocolate. And if you can see this, it's shiny, but it hasn't set up yet. You can see that it's still very liquid. Even though I know it's cool to the touch, this wasn't in full temper. So what I'm gonna do, keep stirring this just a moment or two more, and when we come back, we're gonna have fully tempered chocolate, and I'm gonna show you what you can do with it. Welcome back. So, if you've put the right amount of chocolate in, if you've kept stirring it, gotten it just to the right point, what you should end up with is, one, a bowl of chocolate that even though it is cooled off, is still very liquid, hasn't set up. My test spatula has a few things you'll be able to notice. You'll actually be able to see that the chocolate isn't smooth. It actually has ridges where I tapped it in and it is setting up. Those are the things I'm looking for. And as we tapped it to our lip, we could feel that it was just slightly cool. All those things come together to make a chocolate that will set up at room temperature. Now, room temperature here in Florida in the summertime is, you know, 72 degrees and high humidity. So it may be different where you're at. If you're somewhere where you keep your house colder or it's less humid, you might find that your chocolate sets up even quicker and you might even find that you have to keep your chocolate a little bit warmer. Now, one of the things you're gonna notice is if you make a big bowl of this, as you work with it, yes, the chocolate will eventually begin to set up. As you're working with the chocolate, what's gonna happen is more stable crystals will be created. And because more stable crystals are created, you're gonna to have to raise the temperature just a little bit. The actual working temperature of this chocolate is between 91 and 94 degrees. That means as the day goes by and you get more and more stable crystals from agitation, you might even have to warm this up just a little bit. You can do this a couple of ways. I have a heat gun, like you'd buy at Home Depot for you know, heating up paint to, to take paint off. And hitting a heat gun just barely on the top of this will warm the top of this enough where I can stir it in and it'll actually set all the chocolate right. You can do it with a hair dryer on a hot setting too. What we're gonna do now though is we're gonna do a little bit of piping and I'm gonna show you the neat things you can do with just a small amount of chocolate that's been properly tempered, all right? So, first things first, I'm gonna show you in a later video how to make these triangles out of a piece of parchment paper. It's actually the first thing that my pastry students do is we make a bunch of these triangles. And we're gonna take this and I'm gonna form a cone out of this piece of parchment paper. Also called a coronet. My favorite cookbook is actually a book that has nothing but how to pipe with a coronet. It's called Piping from a Paper Cone. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to create a very, very sharp point. Because I'd rather start with as small of an opening as possible. If possible, no opening. I'm gonna take a spoon, and believe it or not, you need very little chocolate. And you try to work it, let the chocolate drip. And when the chocolate stops dripping, then you can pour it in your cone. Because the important thing to realize and the important thing I tell my students is you want the chocolate on the inside of the bag, not on the outside of the bag, okay? You should be working very clean, very, very clean. I'm going to take this cone and I'm going to flatten it, fold the top over one way, fold the top over the other way, and then fold it down. And what I've done is I've locked all the chocolate right inside that cone. So it's not going anywhere, especially not all over me. Now I've got a very small hole on this. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab a knife and I'm going to actually take and cut a tiny bit of chocolate. Now, 
a small pair of scissors works great. I like using a knife just because it flattens the hole a little bit and then I can shape it with my fingers just perfectly. And if you've done this right, the chocolate will flow beautifully out of the hole. Now, for practice, I like using a plate because the top of a plate is about the size of a small birthday cake or an occasion cake. So what we're going to do is we're going to say happy birthday. And today is actually one of my cousin's birthdays, so I'm going to send a happy birthday to her. And here we go. I typically will hold the piping bag in my right hand between two fingers and my thumb using pressure from my thumb. My left hand is just stabilizing and I'll actually get my arms locked into my side so that I can very, very smoothly pipe the chocolate. All right, are you ready? Let's go. Every chef has its own, his own style, or her own style, when it comes to piping. It's funny, I have friends that are pastry chefs and I can see something written and I know who did it just by their style. So, it's just practice. That's all it takes. Lots and lots and lots of practice. In our next video, I'm going to show you how to make the paper cones, and I'm going to show you some techniques to help you learn how to pipe chocolate. All right? Thanks a bunch, and we'll see you next time.